Welcome, everybody. My name is Gemma, and I'm the pastor here at Mitcham Lane Baptist Church. On behalf of the wider church family, I want to welcome you all to our home. We pray that you may find this a place of hope and hospitality, not just today, but always. We have a few points of housekeeping to just make you aware of. The toilets, the all-important thing, are situated through this corridor here, across the foyer and are signposted. Alternatively, there is a toilet at the back, just uh, to my left here, as you head out the doors. We're pretty informal here as a church, so if you need to go, don't worry about airs and graces, just go. We aren't expecting a fire drill, so if the alarm goes off, we do need to move. And we'll move together out of the doors that you came in from. We will head across the road, so across Wellham Road, running alongside St. James's Church, and we will loiter in their driveway. But don't worry, Rob the vicar is here. <laughs> it's not going to surprise him while he's having his tea. Our MLBC members will help you as we do that, if we need to do that. Everybody's welcome to join us for tea and tizer after the service. We'll be going through to our hall for that. So when we finish, some of our team will just help guide you through. It's just beyond the toilets. Well, friends, we've gathered this afternoon because Mr. David Allen Chambers has sadly died. And the life that we all shared with him has come to an end. This is a time of parting loss and sadness. All of us who knew David had a unique relationship with him. Death does not bring this to an end. Our memories stay. His influence stays. And we remain. David was made in the image of God and was baptised into the Christian faith. Every moment of his life, he was a dearly loved child of God. His death does not alter God's love for him. And at the heart of death, there is a great mystery. There is much we cannot know or understand. Death marks for every person the boundary between the life God gives in this world and the new life God gives beyond. Today, we stand on this boundary not knowing what lies beyond our seeing, our hearing, or our imagining. Yet by faith, we grasp God's promise, declared in the resurrection of Jesus, that we shall not die into oblivion, but shall all be changed. Even in sorrow, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit working in our hearts to truly say, thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This was David's truth. Now, it might seem a bit obvious, but this is David's service. David was one of the fortunate people to know what was happening to him. He knew that his moments were coming to an end, and so everything that we have encountered today pretty much was of his choosing. For his confidence in the love, mercy, and grace of God consistently shone brightly and for David, the good news of Jesus was such good news that he wanted to take one last opportunity to tell you all about it. So today is mostly David's vision. Foolishly, he trusted me with some creative license to fill in the gaps. I did try to convince him, as Hannah will testify, that as a dying man, he could request whatever he wanted and people would be obliged to do what he asked. However, he turned down my suggestion of asking Phil to wear a Batman costume to speak at the crematorium. But seriously, David wanted the contents of this service to gift you comfort and joy. He would be thoroughly embarrassed by all of us gathering in this way. But I hope that we play, pay honour to what a great man he was and what a good friend he has been to so many. And that we give thanks for a life lived in service to God. So let's start by praying. Loving God, 
You have given us life with all its possibilities for growth and all its opportunities for service. You have made us in your own image, responsible and creative, open to great visions and capable of great imagination. In Jesus Christ, you have shown us what we might be. When you raised him to life, you showed us that death is not the end for those who put their trust in you. Thank you for this new life in Christ and for the hope of its future fullness. This day, we thank you especially for the life of David, and we thank you for all that he meant to us. We thank you for his faith in you and all that we saw of you through him. Today, as we remember, help us to commit ourselves anew to your service so that our thanksgiving for David might show itself in a readiness to be faithful to your will. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, David has chosen for you to sing some songs today. So would you stand with me as you're able, as we sing together in Christ alone and Psalm 23.
Please do take your seats. In times of loss, God's people have always drawn strength from the promise of God in the Bible. Let us now listen for God's word of life as the scriptures are read to us. Francesca. The reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8 verses 31 to 39. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, We face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, 
neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. David Allen Chambers was born in Lewisham on the 30th of August 1942 to Alan and Maud Chambers. David soon found himself the eldest of three boys, alongside Brian and then later Michael. Each of the three sons were very different, and Michael describes David as academic. But David confessed to me that he was never very good at exams, having missed large periods of schooling due to his ill health, caused by his then undiagnosed celiac disease. The early family years were spent in Hyde, Kent. Alan, David's father, was a quantity surveyor before he became ill with MS and the family moved to Sunnymead Avenue in Mitcham in about 1953. And from there, they moved to Ringdale Road in Streatham. But David came to Mitcham Lane Baptist Church in 1955 and planted himself here as part of the fixtures and fittings. Sadly, David's dad, Alan, died in 1957, and life was tough for the family. Things were different then. So with no husband and no father, life was difficult. Maud, David's mother, was described as strict. And after a while, as a widow, she married Jack Nile. David, in his last few days, spoke incredibly highly of Jack, recalling that it was a happy marriage for his mum, Sadly, though, Jack also died, and finding herself a widow once again, Maud went on to marry her first husband, Alan's brother. I asked David about this marriage, and he described it as a bit of a disaster all round. Was that fair? As I said, David confessed that he was never very good at exams. He had a great general knowledge and a natural disposition for learning, but he just couldn't get on with exams, so university was never in his plan. Instead, in 1959, he applied for a scheme to work at the former London County Council. He told me he was really nervous about the whole process, but during the interview, he was able to make the panel laugh, and he thought that that was the deal breaker for him being accepted. David was then asked to list the departments he would like to work in. David, leading a successful boys' brigade company and being a Sunday school teacher, naturally put education as his top choice. He left licensing as his bottom choice. So, of course, he was allocated licensing, and that's where it all began. Firstly, in petroleum licensing, then vehicle licensing, pre-DVLA days, they see. I'm told that he became quite an expert in detecting dodgy MOT certificates and trying to hang on to customers who forged these certificates until the police arrived was a regular test of ingenuity and an imagination that I think David found quite exciting, to be honest. It was in 1969 that David took a bit of a sabbatical break from licensing and went to the next five years to GLC's Parks Department. There, he was responsible for looking after everything from zoos to cemeteries. Yep, we had zoos. And even the circus when it came to town. It kept him busy. But by this time, the Boys Brigade Company had become so big that they were in dire need of an influx of new staff. David explained that Hutch told him a new teacher had started at her school and she, she suggested that maybe this new arrival, Miss Jean Stewart, could help. Well, on the 21st of October 1972, David married Miss Jean Stewart and indeed she helped. They got married here in this church and they moved together to Grayswood Street before then moving to Woodnook Road. Hutch was very right as Jean became involved in the life of the Boys Brigade Company and of the church. 
David often told me that the two of them longed for children. But David was diagnosed with celiac disease at 25. And as a couple, they were told they could not adopt because David was not expected to live beyond 40. How things are different, eh? However, whilst they never physically had children or formally adopted, it has become clear over the last few years that they had many children. People who throughout the years they drew alongside, adopted spiritually and invested in. Mr. Chambers was highly thought of by those Boys Brigade boys, and the legacy of his time with them is immeasurable. In 1974, David's sabbatical was over, and he returned to licensing, firstly as deputy and then as head of the GLC Entertainment's licensing division. It seems to me that 1985 was a big year in David's career, now it seems utter madness, but then the chief executive of Chelsea Football Club at the time, Ken Bates, thought erecting a 12-foot high fence that was electrified around the perimeter of the pitch at Stamford Bridge would be just the deterrent that any supporter looking to invade the pitch uh, needed. Bates is cited in the press as saying, it's been used in farming for a very long time. With the potential for this to, sit, to set a dangerous precedent, David and his team took to task. And thanks to David, the fence was illegally dismantled, having never been switched on. Later in the year, a devastating fire at Bradford City's football club led to a major safety team investigation of all significant sports grounds. And David found himself once again on the national news. This time, there was a threat of closure to several high-profile venues who were unprepared to make the changes, and they were out to brand him as the bad guy in the process. His steadfast resolve to do the right thing and not be bribed or bullied away from his role saw changes made nationally that have impacted millions of sports fans' lives. In 1986, Westminster County Council recruited David to head up their new licensing division, where he found himself the author of three parliamentary bills on licensing matters and helped to steer them through Parliament. It was during this season that the West End was known as the Wild West, and David introduced a door supervisor registration scheme using entertainment license conditions. As someone who was a babe in arms in the 80s, I was fascinated to hear how Soho had developed its culture of strip clubs, sex shops, and peep shows. When we spoke of his considerable work in Soho, David said he knew he was never going to stop the sex trade, but he could help make it safe for everyone and to keep creating rules and boundaries to which people were held accountable. Recently, this might seem a little odd, but recently we talked at length about peep shows. I know, if you know David as the proper gent, this might shock you a little bit. He was telling me how the fines failed to act as a deterrent because the money that could be made way outweighed the fines that were being given. So they brought in some regulations that meant the peep show physical mechanisms, the shutters that made the peep business, removed. You can't make money if you can't operate. And so David found that to be a great motivator for people to behave. We laughed as David told me stories that I can't share from up here. <laughs> but trust me, David Allen Chambers, the most proper gentleman I think I've ever met, had seen a thing or two and things that made even me blush. In July 2000, David officially took early retirement. Not that he actually stopped working, don't be fooled. Rather, David set up his own consultancy and training company, which quickly took off. He found himself traveling all over the country to train others in licensing. In one article, he described this season as 
I was a gamekeeper turned poacher as I went from regulating Westminster street traders to representing them. In 2005, the Institute of Licensing was born and David became a director. He continued on the board for a further 17 years, only stopping recently to invest in his own house. Like a doting dad. David was incredibly proud. He had seen this small organization grow into a highly respected and professional body that it has become. He glowed when he spoke about it and all the people that he had the pleasure to serve alongside. And he was thankful for the love and support the Institute gifted back to him. He was amazed how many people showed up for Jeannie's funeral, having never met her. As many of you remember, Jeannie's health deteriorated, and so in 2014, her Alzheimer's became such that David needed to give up most of his paid work to look after her. And look after her, he really did. Whilst I never got to meet Jeannie, the affection with which he spoke about her was inspiring. Life had not been easy for them. Both of them had encountered challenges with their health and had loved and lost. David shared how hard it was for him as Jeannie's health shifted and changed and she no longer remembered him as she had known him. I know he was thankful to Olive, his friend from church, for all the companionship she gave to Jeannie. If you were blessed enough to receive a Christmas newsletter from David, then you will know what a difference Olive made to both Jeannie and David with her friendship. David expressed sorrow that his brother Brian died during COVID and the family were unable to gather to say a proper goodbye. During this season, he really missed his visits to see his brother Michael. Usually they would see each other every Christmas and David really did love Christmas. Together, they always played priest in the parish. The priest of the parish has lost his thinking cap. Some say this and some say that. I know he's taught some of you to play it too. All of this, and we haven't yet scratched the surface on David's 68 years here at MLBC. During that time, it seems that there have been at least four double terms he spent as church secretary, at least three where he was treasurer, and for a few seasons, there's about six-year period, I think, where he was both secretary and treasurer. As the stories of David have unfolded, it appears that every time there has been a difficult conversation to have here, or MLB has been in crisis, and it has many crises, David was brought in, the peacemaker and negotiator, his steady gentleness mixed with a dollop of common sense and a drizzle of the Holy Spirit made David the person for such a time as this only time after time after time. In his younger years, he led the Boys Brigade here with utter commitment and resolve. He taught Sunday school and led home groups and seemingly had a go on almost every rotor that you can imagine, including, of course, preaching. So committed to sharing God's word was David that he was due to preach in a couple of weeks time. But knowing that his health had been a bit temperamental, he prepared his sermon months ago. David chose his final message to be on the importance of believers baptism and he made us promise that you would still get to hear it even if he wasn't here to deliver it himself. So please do come to church on Sunday the 15th of October at 10.30 to hear David's last sermon. I'm sorry, but I would have been in trouble if I hadn't invited you. Except it won't really be his last sermon, will it? David practiced what he preached and he preached what he knew, the lavish saving grace of God. On paper, David and I would not be two characters that you would put next to one another at a dinner party. Our life experiences were vastly different, our age, our economic statuses, worlds apart, and yet David consistently demonstrated grace to me at every turn. 
And I'm betting if he did this to me, then he probably did it for you too. Consistency in David's grace seems to be an emerging theme that is spoken about when his name is mentioned. And yet, despite being consistent, he wasn't married to traditions or rules or regulations and obligations when it came to his faith. For David, it was all about God's saving grace and his role as a disciple to extend it to others. That meant he was okay when we made changes where others might assume that his age would stop him from embracing change. But see, the Bible talks about the fruits of the Spirit, outward characteristics that should be present in the lives of all Christian believers. Some of us have big doses of them, and some just a little smidge, and some of us are still trying to work on them. But these characteristics are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All words that have been used to sum up David to us in the last few weeks. David was a good man, but he didn't demonstrate these qualities in his own strength. No, rather it was his relationship with God that fueled him. He truly sought to follow Jesus' example. To know David was to know the ways of Jesus, even if you've never encountered Jesus for yourself. And now that you know the ways of David, it is your turn. The sermon is in you and for you to practice what he preached. And of course, there's still time for you to encounter Jesus for yourself. I have to tell you that he made it very clear he wanted everyone to be given the opportunity to meet Jesus as their own Lord and Saviour. So that's it. We sum up David with these many words. But he was more than that, more than I knew, more than the pieces of paper can say. And so in just a bit, we will hear some other tributes from other people too. But for now, we're going to stand as we are able and sing a song chosen by David, It Is Well With My Soul. Do you stand with me as you're able, please?
Please do take your seats. Our first tribute comes from Reverend Ivan King. Ivan can't be here today, so instead he has made a video for us to watch.
Amen. We were very fortunate that Ivan was visiting uh, David on the day that David died. In fact, he turned up just in time to be with us as David died. Ivan, as he said himself, was just one of many. He is a story that we're sharing, but there are countless men of a certain age now who've come forward and said that it was David that helped to mold them into the father's the brothers, the uncles, the people that they are. Gareth Hughes wanted to say some words about David having worked with him, but unfortunately he too isn't able to be here. He did, however, send over what he wanted to share. So I'm now going to channel my inner Gareth Hughes. And you have to think that I'm Gareth saying this because it's written in his person. I am Gareth Hughes uh, and I'm a a barrister for most of, sorry, my name is Gareth Hughes and I am a barrister for almost 40 years who first met David way back in the mid 80s when he was head of licensing at the old Greater London Council. And I was just a young barrister starting out my practice and doing a little bit of licensing and gaming work. In those days, David and I were often on opposite sides of the legal argument. As I sought to defend operators of the persecution of whom, prosecution of whom David had authorised, I had the opportunity to cross-examine him as well. Even then, he was always scrupulously honest and fair, sometimes to the detriment of his own case. However, this summed up perfectly the way in which he conducted his professional life and his personal life. Several years later, after the abolition of the GLC, David transferred across to the head of the licensing team at Westminster, and I joined the council, subsequently becoming deputy head of legal services. It was at this time that the bond between David and I grew even closer as we worked side by side to help clean up some of the seedier aspects of life in Soho in the late 80s and early 90s. David and I often talked about his deeply religious beliefs, and I often teased him 
about the work that he was now doing in his capacity as licensing chief in Westminster. He had to visit many a peep show and illegal beer bars prior to either closing them down or getting them properly licensed. Throughout it all, David never allowed his strong Christian belief to get in the way of his balanced and fair judgment in licensing matters, and he always struggled always struggled to ensure that he got the right answer when determining certain applications or arguing them in front of licensing committees. David and I worked closely with Peter Stringfellow, I know, on Peter's first innovative idea in London of a lap dancing club. We had many meetings on site. <laughs> We have <laughs> just picturing it. We had many meetings on site and in council buildings with Peter as he described in detail the kind of aspect, acts and performances which the girls would put on for paying customers, which very often involved complete nudity. I was often aware, again, of David's blushes as we discussed all these things with the Stringfellow team. Again, he conducted himself with total scrupulousness in assisting and advising Peter on how to correctly go about obtaining a license for this revolutionary new lap dancing concept. In the end, and after an exceptionally long licensing committee hearing, the council determined to grant the license to Stringfellows, and Peter very kindly sent a case of champagne to myself and David. My delight in receiving the gift was quickly tempered by the fact that as a public servant at the time, I had to hand the case of champagne back to the authority. This was made far easier for David as he was, of course, a teetotaler. Again, it was great fun to see this case of champagne sitting in David's office, knowing it had no attraction to him whatsoever and would be handed back to the care of the local authority without a drop ever having been touched. As a footnote, years later when I was in private practice, Peter found out that I had to hand the case of champagne back and very kindly sent me a fresh case of champagne. <laughs> David didn't get a fresh case. I remember also being informed by David that the licensing committee would have to sit in in order to view the film the last temptation of Christ. Something that yet again, David himself would never have watched and ran counter to his strong religious convictions. But yet again, he endured the showing of the film in order to come to a fair judgment on whether it should receive a classification prior to its premiere in Leicester Square. David was more in his element when dealing with street trading issues where the moral conflict never entered the equation. However, it was not long before he had been drawn back into the world of special treatment licensing and licensing of massage parlours. It was as a mark of respect with which he was held that the Home Office in 2000 chose to consult with David on the initial drafts of the licensing bill which subsequently became the Licensing Act in 2003 and changed the entire system of licensing in England and Wales. As the lawyers advising, I was privileged to sit with David on those early committees and was impressed with the way in which he approached the proposed reforms and the vast amount of knowledge that he was able to bring to the table with government officials. They respected him enormously and it was David that would, they would often return to, seeking advice on wording and drafting the new legislation. Later, David was instrumental in setting up what is now the National Institute of Licensing and negotiating the union between two national bodies involved in licensing at the time. 20 years on, the National Institute is again the go-to organisation for those in central government when it comes to the issue of licensing reform. Throughout all those years, David was an invaluable member of the National Board with his encyclopedic knowledge of licensing 
and of the Institute's constitution. We loved a constitution. <laughs> David and I had a close friendship of over 40 years, and I always found him to be scrupulously honest, kind, generous, self-effacing, and primarily and importantly for him, a humble man of faith and a strong believer in God's word. I know that he was an important contributor to the work of the Baptist Church and participated in many local voluntary activities. As David was an intensely religious man, when thinking about him, I was often drawn to the words of the Bible from the first book of Kings, chapter 3, verse 9. Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. In all the work he did in this controversial area in which we were both involved, David applied this principle. As a public servant, I know he prayed for guidance as what the right thing to do was in exceedingly difficult circumstances. In my view, he got it right in most cases. And that sense of fair play, decency and justice will be one of his lasting legacies and the way in which I will remember him for the rest of my life. Perhaps some of that content has come as a bit of a shock to you. Uh, in the last few months of David's life, while he was unwell, I spent a lot of time sat with David listening to the stories, so I'm not surprised, but they do make me chuckle. Uh, if, you've ever been, if you've ever been in a lap dancing club, Try picturing David Chambers <laughs> in that context. Um, yeah. I'd asked Wally whether he would share a few words. Wally, do you feel able to? <laughs> Thank you. I'm normally speaking out the dock. <laughs> In my local <laughs> church, <laughs> uh, I don't know how to follow those eminent people. Just to say, I've known David since 1985. Someone today said, "How did you know David?" I said, "He was a friend, an enemy, and a colleague." We finished up very, very good friends. I'm from one side of the track; he's from the other. But one thing we both had: we were both straight, and we both told the truth. Offend or please, that's how we were. And David, you know, when he left the council, because when he came in, in 1985, I had a big battle with him in the House of Lords. Um, he was trying to promote a bill for the GLC that really affected all the street traders in London, the whole of London. We managed to get it defeated. Um, Tony, it was, it was the MP at the time, he slung the towel in because there were so many people that turned up in the Houses of Parliament that all the MPs were running out the doors saying, <laughs> where's my constituents? Where's my constituents? We were all there. And we got it thrown out. And David then worked for the uh, City of Westminster. And with Kensington and Chelsea, they were drafted in to promote the 1990 um, London Local Authorities Act. And I sat with David many, many times. And as he said, we were horse trading. I got one thing, he got something else. Um, I thought I won, he said he won. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, we finished up with a piece of paper that is in Parliament as the 1990 Act. And afterwards, I said to him, about 1992, 93, I said, here, David, I think you did win. There's a couple of things in that act that are not good. They're not working. <laughs> Any chance? Let me have a look, Wally. He said, there's a particular thing that I want in it. And I said, well, there's a couple of things that we need. One of them was personal trading, because we're in the 20th century, and they expected us to work from 9 till 5 then. The licenses now are from 8 till 11. So seven days a week. You couldn't physically be on the stall all that time. So he wrote something called the 1999 City of Westminster Act. And that's how we've been governed. And he always said to me, and I say it to Nicola and the girls, I always say, he said to me, Wally, 
don't fight the battles you can't win. <laughs> he said, it's better to listen than to speak. You learn a lot more. Mm. So I have learned a lot from David. He's, I was a rough diamond, I suppose. I worked off a suitcase in Oxford Street and I promoted myself up with the help of him. And I was one of those people that reacted. You know, the council would write us a stinking letter and I would write a stinking letter back. And then David said to me, don't write back, write to me and I'll tell you what to say. And he's been my friend. I'm going to miss him. I, I, you know, I'm going to miss him. Not just for the street traders, but as a man. You know, we've probably got nearly 100 members in the West End Street Trade Association. They've sent these flowers today. Mm. This is, you know, the condolences that they sent to me, I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, every single one of them. But what they said, David was a gentleman. And you've got to realise, people use that word, oh, he's a gentleman. They don't realise. He was the gentleman. There's no one better than him. I've never known him to tell a lie. He's only ever shouted at me once. <laughs> 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 only once. He was right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he never, it was just calm and gentle. And he said, put the phone down, ring me back in 15 minutes. 15 <laughs> minutes, I picked the phone. Have you calmed down? Yeah, <laughs> okay, let's carry on. You know, he's, he's just an inspiration, a gentleman. I miss him. I miss him to the day I go. And I loved him dearly. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Wally. Well, David was part of a small group here in the life of church. We call them cell groups, but I don't want you to think about prison. So think about it as a small group. And uh, Tom is going to come and share a few words from the group. I think there's a picture that we can show you of the group. Motley Crue. I was just thinking that when David used to be up the front, he would look up and see the people in the balcony and say, you're very, very blessed because you're much nearer to God than we are down there. Yeah. <laughs> so my name's Tom and I am the lead facilitator of a home group. Um, and I've been given the privilege to speak on behalf of the group. So there are, there are ten of us at the moment. Um, and I just want to be able to share some thoughts that we put together for David. Um, let's put this up here. We meet every week to study the Bible and to pray uh, and to support each other. And yes, we do play some crazy ball games. <laughs> It's not one. Uh, so, David belonged to this group for a very, very long time. He was a leader, and I was privileged to sit next to him in his home as I began to learn how to lead from him. He had a, he cherished the evenings with his home group. He had a deep personal relationship which he founded with, with all of us. And we prayed for each other and we prayed for him. I asked everyone to give one or two sentences to sum up what they will remember about David. Some words came up time and time again. His humility, his honesty, his encouragement always quick to praise God and to be thankful even when he was going through some very tough times. As one member of it said, he was always the first person to reply to emails. <laughs> and I can remember giving him a lift home. And I lived 
probably two minutes away from him, and when I got in, there was his email from that <laughs> night. So if you, if you know David, he was like that all the time. He encouraged everyone to speak up, and he made sure that we all had and felt, we all felt our opinions were valued. Others reflected on his passion for church life, tirelessly leading and inspiring, inspiring us from the front. He always acknowledged that our Christian life was never going to be easy. And he was always there to support each of us when our particular journey got a bit tricky. And of course, he looked back on his decades with the Boys Brigade with the deepest joy. David adhered to the Boys Brigade motto, sure and steadfast to the very end of his life. We will miss him. Thank you. Well, it's not possible to be in the life of church for all those years and not have some long-term friends. So, Graham, would you like to come and join me? Graham has asked if he can share some words with us for David. It's lovely to see you. Welcome back. When I was asked to um, say something today, I wasn't very sure about it. Oh, it's getting up to speak. I haven't done that for a long time. Um, it's different to lead in worship. <laughs> uh, and I never thought I'd be standing here today speaking about David. It's very sad that he's gone now. I, I was just about to write to him and send him a card, but I was too late too late. And I've, I've known David since I was a, a teenager back in the <laughs> late 50s, early 60s when I came to Mitcham Lane and joined the company section of Boys Brigade. Hence, this is for David today, my badge. And I've had the privilege of serving with David alongside him on diaconate and leadership here over the years. A real privilege. Of David, I would say, whatever he was involved in in church life, he put his everything into it. The way he served God and loved God. He did the best that anyone could ever do. And we know he did a great job as treasurer and church secretary and treasurer and church secretary <laughs> over the years. But to me, I'm going to speak personally, David was a great encourager. That's how I see David. At least he was to me, I don't know about you. And I don't know how many letters he's written to people in his time here. But it's funny because um, I thought to myself, well, what, what am I going to say? And it's all been said. It's all been said. But as I was looking at some documents and sorting stuff out because I've just been moved on a year and I'm still sorting stuff out and I, I was sorting some documents out and I found, would you believe two letters from David and I wonder how many letters he sent to people <laughs> over the years letters of encouragement and I want to, to read you just a, a few snippets from one, I won't read it all He starts this letter. I don't even know the date of it. He didn't put a date on this one. Um, but all I know is it was when the pastor here was David Whitlock, who some of you will Oh, that's the, that's the 90s then. His 90s, was it that long? Yes, it was that long ago. Because the other one I got was 1999. Um, he started off his letter with a quote from Joshua 1.9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And my, my thoughts were when I was thinking about today is, well, what would David say to us today? What would his last words be to us until we meet him again? And I know I will meet him again when we go to be with the Lord. And I'm going to read, if that's okay, just a, a few bits. I won't read it all. 
He says, I want you to write to say thank you for the positive response you made to the invitation on Sunday morning to come and humble yourself before God. This was a real challenge this Sunday, especially for the men of the church here. Where was I? <laughs> on Sunday. Um, personally, I found the whole experience overwhelming. Jesus met with me in a really powerful way, a humbling way. And the sight of so many men crying out to God and lifting their hands up to heaven was incredibly moving. I firmly believe that Sunday morning was a significant turning point for the men of Mitcham Lane. Jesus met with us very specifically and powerfully. Full of the fruits of that encounter will only be realized in the months ahead as we walk together in obedience. What God is calling us to will, sorry, what God is calling us to will require strength and courage. There will be times when fear and discouragement will not be far away. But remember one thing, God goes with us wherever we go. Joshua was led into a new territory. And since you have never been this way before, and many of you overcoming the months will lead, be led into ministries and giftings that you have never known before. And that's very true. Some of you will have the gift of faith, others prophecy, others healing, other stuff goes on and on. All of us will be called to step out in one way or another. My purpose in writing this letter is to encourage you. Because this is what I saw David as an encourager. You will begin to make, make these steps. Can I encourage you to continue, continue seeking God and the, and the revival I'm sure he wants to bring? Now the time is the time for consistency and diligence in our walk with Jesus. One of the ways we can do this is through prayer. And he specifically mentions men's prayer together which was happening at that time. But these are the words that I think David would finish with, which he finished in this letter. It's from Hebrews chapter 10. And his words to me, and I hope to you too, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. With every blessing, David. God bless you, David. We're going to stand as we are able, as we sing together, 10,000 Reasons.
please do take your seats. We've heard tributes from all sorts of different people, but we wanted to give everybody an opportunity, if they wanted to, to be able to say something. For David didn't want things to go left unsaid. As many of you will know in his final days, he called different people in so that he could have his last words with them. In fact, about an hour before he died, he was on FaceTime to Francesca, telling her what she should say at the pay review committee meeting. (laughs) Such was David. So if you have anything you would like to share, then, well, we have a microphone and we have a pocket of time. Just come on forward. Yeah, come on up. Are you all right with the steps? Hi, my name's Babs. Um, I joined Boys Br- uh, Girls Brigade when I was five and uh, Sunday school at Mitchum Lane Baptist. And um, um, I met this awesome man in a, a dark uniform at the Boys Brigade. And I, I thought he was the most scary person ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, Oh, uh, I could never be like him because he was so um, tall and scary and I'd never be like um, so um, um, sensible and um, strict and um, commanding like he was. And um, I went through Girls' Brigade and um, I, from um, a cadet to uh, a young leader and I joined the Girls' Brigade band and uh, I became um, uh, the head bugler and um, I ended up marching along with um, David Chambers and um, I ended up being the head bugler and... Um, I, I could um, play the bugle really, really well. And um, I could, um, when I could um, play tunes, I could end up putting uh, little twiddly bits on the ends of the tunes. And he, David Chambers used to look at me really <laughs> sternly. <laughs> <laughs> Disapprovingly. <laughs> I didn't care because I, <laughs> I, I used to think it was um, a beautiful. <laughs> and um, when I became a young leader um, in the Sunday school and he was teaching me and he was so encouraging and I became uh, a friend with, with him and he was so wonderful and um, he encouraged me so much. And um, he became uh, like a, a, a big uncle to, to me. And I thought he was so awesome. Um, he made me um, feel like I was like one of his family. And I, w- I was so proud of knowing him. And uh, he made me grow as a Christian. And I was so proud of knowing him. I I was so sad when I heard he he died. It's such a shame. Um, I didn't know him enough. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Babs. Thank you. Oh, Babs has got her badge on as well. (laughs) Fabulous. Thank you, Babs. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Hi, my name's uh, Rob. I'm the vicar of the church over the road, St. James's Church, where you're going to be gathering if the fire goes <laughs> later on. Um, but just very, very quickly, um, 
just want to say how much I value David's wisdom uh, and his friendship. He was a, a stalwart member of this church family, but he was a passionate advocate for our work together as churches in this community. And we have something called the First Down Churches Covenant, which before I came here, I'd never heard of anything like it. Three Anglican churches and a Baptist church working together. So doing our own thing on Sunday mornings, but running projects together, worshipping together now and again, praying together, uh, uh, mm. just being in fellowship with each other and the labels not really mattering at all. And David was a passionate advocate mm. for the church's covenant uh, and I'll always be grateful to him uh, for, for that. Uh, and uh, I pray that his legacy, part of his legacy will be that we continue to work together uh, as mm. churches in this community to serve God in the way that he so passionately wanted to do. So thank you, David. Thanks, Rob. I'm giving one last eye scan around the room. Now you're all trying to avoid making eye contact with me. Well, I'm sure as we have tea and Tizer, there will be many stories to come out. I think David quite liked the mischievous, naughty ones, didn't he? I asked him, and he was telling me all these stories, particularly about life here at Mitcham Lane, when it was, there was lots of young adults, late teenagers, young adults, that group that Phil that spoke at the crematorium and Graham and him were in. I, I quite would have liked to have little, had a little sneaky peek at what they were really like, because I've only known them as older people. And so I said to him, David, who was the most mischievous, naughty one? And he went... <laughs> so I think we've heard today that potentially had a fondness, Babs, Wally, me, a fondness for the mischievous ones. Shall we pray together? God, source of all life, mysterious, profound, generous in love, we give thanks because we have seen you in David. We give thanks for his life and for all that he was and for all that he gave of himself to his family, to friends, to the community of faith in the church, to the world of work and to the wider community. We give thanks for what he was to each one of us and we give thanks that he was such a person that we are moved to grief and sorrow by his loss. Help us through his death to more clearly see the significance of life and to grasp more firmly the hope that we are more than our years and that love is indeed stronger than death. We pray for ourselves, disturbed by the great mystery of death, facing the questions it raises within and the loss that it brings. We pray that we will not be overwhelmed but my face honestly what confronts us, so that we may sorrow freely and turn to life again with courage and with hope. As we honour David, we commit ourselves to care for each other, to bring hope to the despairing and joy to those who sorrow. God be with us here this day and in all the days to come. May we live as those who remember the past and who have hope for the future. Amen. Well, I've asked Blossom if she will come and bring to us the final of David's readings. Um, just before I read, um, since I knew I'd be up here, um, I was away in America for about 40 years, working in between, and I used to come in the summer um, to say hello to my group, and it's always with my church. And um, when, I got re when I retired six years ago, um, I came start coming to church, and, so, and he knew. He said, every Sunday would come over Blossom. Um, shall I write for the letter from Rhode Island that you're going to be back here? I said, no, not yet, David. He keeps bugging me every, every Sunday. Until finally, I said, oh, yes, write to them now. But I said, tell you what, when you write to them and I become a member, 
no more work for me. I'm easy. I'm over 80 now, so I just can relax. He said, rubbish. <laughs> Don't you give me that blossom. I said, why not, David? He said, I have something to tell you. And he, you know, it's always scriptural. He said, Moses called God when he was over 80 to do the work of leading people from Israel to Egypt. So he said, don't give me that. You're always working for the Lord. And he always have that encouraging thing about him as a man. And over the years, I have known him as a, in his 20s when all these ge gentlemen here was all teenagers when I first came here. But it was just wonderful to actually know him. We have had our righteous anguinists together, he and I, but with love and share. But he was real. All what's said today is just David. And we praise the Lord for him and may his soul rest in peace. And thank you for having me to read this. Psalms 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rest your soul in peace, David Chambers. Well, we are coming into land in just a second, but just a word of notice. We will be joining together in the hall. So this is through this door across the foyer into our lovely hall and garden where you're welcome to join us for an afternoon tea. There is actual cup of tea or you can indeed enjoy a tizer. There's also an offering plate. So as you go out of these doors on my right, just at the very back, there's a cabinet on the right and there's a plate there. Any offering given today will be given to the Alzheimer's Society at David's request. In his Christmas newsletter of 2017, David wrote this. At Jeannie's funeral, we sang the song, My Lighthouse. As I conclude this letter, I can say that whether the seas of life have been rough or smooth, God has indeed been my lighthouse, and that he will, in his time, see me safe to shore. So please would you stand with me as you are able, as we sing those truths in our final song, My Lighthouse.
the example of Jesus and David in your hearts and minds. Go out into this world. Be of good courage. Hold fast to all which is good. And render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Honour and comfort the afflicted. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love today and always. Amen. Amen. As I said, please do feel free to join us if you can. There are some photographs of David um, and some articles about his work. It'd be great if you could join us.